Thank you very much, Amos. All right. Yeah, I also thank you for inviting us. I mean, Amos is somewhat like a hero in our team because he is not bio-creating only Solosaurus, but only also our registry <laughs> in a way. Uh, so we get emails quite a lot uh, when he finds discrepancies between published data and data in our registry, and we have then the task to figure out what is right. So thanks uh, for that also. So hip scratch, or however, you, it's very difficult to pronounce, and I will go a little bit to the history why this five consonants in a row name arose. So, but first I will talk about this embryonic and IPS cell lines, which are why they are in the registry, why there is a registry, about what we think about digital cell identities, um, how lines are registered in the registry, and how we collaborate with the bank, with, in this case, the European Bank for IPS cell lines. So the origin, why the human pluripotent stem cell registry exists, are embryonic stem cells. And these were established in 2098. There was the first, first publication on human embryonic stem cell lines. And then the European Union had a problem with that because the ethical issues are very controversial and different countries in the EU had different opinion, opinions on funding this kind of research with human embryonic stem cells. And the European Group of Ethics in 2000 um, stated that, okay, these are cells which can not form an embryo, but form all tissues of the human body in theory. And any research with, with, which uses human embryonic stem cells should be transparent and controlled by a centralized authority. So, and then there was another opinion, opinion 22 of the same group, European Group of Ethics, in 2007, which said, okay, there should be, to be, make this research transparent, there should be a registry. There should be basically a, a tool, a database, where all embryonic stem cell lines are registered. And, um, this platform should be used then by researchers to find existing cell lines and not be forced to make new ones. And uh, also to maximize reproducibility of research, comparability and transparency. So that was essentially the start of the human embryonic stem cell registry. So HESREG is much easier to pronounce than HIPSREG, but in 2000, seven or 2006 for mouse lines, but 2007 for human embryonic uh, pluripotent stem cell lines. This technology was developed. And for those who don't know it really, I mean, probably most of you do. So these start not with uh, an embryo, but with, uh, born, with, with any person uh, where cells can be taken, they are then being reprogrammed the reprogrammed cells have the same or very similar characteristics to human embryonic stem cells, so they can form in theory all cell types of the human body. These cells can, can be made into all cell types or organoids, and these cell types or organoids can then be used in a lot of applications, including cell therapy, where they go back to a person to replace some um, deficient cells or help regenerate and a regeneration of organs. They can also now made, and this puts into question the statement of the uh, European Group of Ethics opinion from 2007, uh, two, from 2000, that pluripotent stem cells cannot form a whole human being. They are, in fact, able to form an embryo. They can also form um, germ cells, so spermatocytes and oocytes, until now only in mice, but the future will show that we can also do that with human cells. So they can, you can essentially use these cells to make a new human being, or at least in, at least in the dish, uh, to a certain degree, of course, restricted by ethical constraints. 
So at the same time, already with embryonic stem cells, there was a need by the community expressed to be able to trace where the cell lines come from. So from what, what institutions, what, what lab, and um, what donor, essentially. And um, now there are new applications, and increasingly people already put gene editing into the cell line before it's reprogrammed. So be before the immortalized cells exist, the cell lines are already different from the donor in terms of genetic composition. So you do the, at the same time where you do the reprogramming, you, use the, you do the gene editing, for example, to introduce a disease uh, gene, or you reprogram immediately after reprogramming, uh, you gene edit immediately after reprogramming and do not care about the original line, but only use re, uh, the edited line. So these are issues which come up, and that requires to trace, in any case, whether you do it after donation or after reprogramming, to trace back where the gene editing, edited or genetically modified line comes from originally. So from which donor, from which original parental IPS cell lines or embryonic stem cell line, so there need to be some kind of pedigree, and Amos already mentioned that in his uh, future work, actually, or existing works already. Um, with iPS cells, you have the additional, let's say, bonus of being able to represent lar large uh, populations in the dish. Essentially, you can make an iPS cell from everybody for whatever application, for preclinical drug testing, for example, to find the right drug for this particular individual or for, or for cell therapies. So you represent in the dish a large part of the population. And that population somehow, um, together with the IPS cell line or with, with, with the models derived from the IPS cell lines, present, as we call it, a bio digital hybrid. So we have the biological entity in two versions in the dish as an IPS-derived organite, for example, and as a living person. And you have the digital information from both, which forms then this hybrid. And you can imagine that you can do a lot of things with this data if they are accessible and if they are democratized, if, as, as we heard on the, in the morning. Um, so what we capture in, in the registry is not only the information on the pluripotent stem cells. Of course, we do that. That's the most important part. And we try to, but we also try to cap, capture information on the donor, for example, clinical information, on the, on the entities derived from the, from, the, from the pluripotent stem cell lines, for example, organoids, on their usage, for example, in clinical trials, and how far these cell lines are, for example, suitable for clinical application or not, what projects use these lines, and um, try to do that in a way that not all this information is in the registry, but linked out to other resources, of course. Uh, it's just not doable, but the basic types of uh, what we register in the, about the cell line, I will come back later, but it's in contrast to, to Cellosaurus, or only recently Cellosaurus did, uh, did um, allows users to register line. We only rely on users to register their lines. And um, so you go to the website, click on I want to register a line, and the first thing that happens, or a clinical study or a project, uh, is that you have to create this name. Uh, which uh, was, is based on, on these needs which I already mentioned. So it's, it identifies the institution where the line has, has been made and it identifies in the last part um, the kind of history of the line. So what was the parental, type, parental line of a genetically modified line? So that's already in this name visible and until now, we have enough space on that name to accommodate all the new lines which are 
which are made. And uh, we exchange, so this is one name for the only for pluripotent stem cells. Um, we link these to Cellosaurus, of course. So Cellosaurus RRID is linked to that name. We also issue, when, pub, when a person registered the line, uh, biosamples ID. Um, other information we register is mentioned here. So uh, these are information on the donor, on the contact details, so where is that line? When I want it, we, we only handling data. When I want this line, when I'm interested in that line, whom do I have to contact? Who generated it? Who is distributing it? Who owns it? And um, then, of course, donor information, disease status, and so on, and a lot of data about the lines. So are these lines indeed pluripotent? Um, what karyotype do they have? What STR profiles they have? Are there any genetic modifications? And some of these uh, data we require. Not all the data are required to validate the line and then to, for example, issue a certificate uh, that these data are there. Um, but most of them are. Key, key information is needed. For example, potency. Is this really differentiated into, three, into the three germ layers? Uh, the karyotype and, for example, the SDR profile. And then come back to the SDR profile a little bit later. Um, so we have a process of then validating the data submitted into the registry. Um, so we have these mandatory fields, which I showed before, which has to be provided by the, by the uh, provider of the data. Um, these are then manu manually validated, and only after all data, including the ethics provenance data, which is most interesting for the, for the funders, uh, especially the European Union, are there. This certificate can be issued. And uh, of course, we then link to supplementary data and, and uh, for example, publications where these lines are mentioned. So in red are the data which are needed to issue a certificate. And um, so STR data we require. However, many labs using pluripotent stem cell lines don't like the STRs. They do SNP analysis, which is easier and cheaper. And in the lab, that works very well. But if you want to compare two lines from other labs, that doesn't work. Um, and um, so we insist on SDR profiles. So I mentioned a little bit uh, the ethics. Uh, so we were set out based on an ethics uh, compromise. So the European Union wants to fund embryonic stem cell research under certain conditions. And uh, we think that this is also very important for pluripotent stem cell lines. For, for induced pluripotent stem cell lines, that the lines which are being used by researchers have the right informed consent to be usable for research, for the research you want to do. And this is often not the case. Um, so what we check for the lines which, which uh, want to have a certificate is uh, whether there is an informed, com uh, information sheet, uh, informed consent information sheet, whether uh, the informed consent information is properly reflected in our ethics it's a data structure, and if applicable, if there is uh, ethics committee approval, an IRB approval for that a donation of the lines or making of the lines or the project itself. So some of the some of the requirements which we, which we need for embryonic stem cell lines, for example, is that the donation was voluntary, that the donation was only for IVF purposes and not for research purposes, the donation of the embryo, that there was uh, anonymization of the donors, and, um, and it was not, let's say, a, a cloned embryo. Um, this is shown again here. I don't want to go into it uh, too much. 
but it takes us quite a lot of time to manually look at these informed consent information sheets, and we find a lot of lines which do not have that. That don't have either historical lines, which just don't have, or very odd types of information. Hela line, you, you know, is a very prominent example for that. Uh, I, I know that companies will not use IPS lines without proper informed consent information, and I think researchers also in universities should not do that. So there is alternative informed consent. For example, you can, you can go to, to your ethics committee and ask, you know, can I use that line? Even though it doesn't have a historical informed consent sheet or only an informed consent which is, doesn't consider data protection, for example. And then this ethics committee decides it gives you at least some backing to use this line if it's so valuable that you have that one. So in the future, we want to implement this so-called healthy hub where we, where we, for every line or also general approaches, guidelines, uh, have data on the ethics, legal, and societal um, provenance of, of certain lines. We already have that for legal um, for the legal environments in different countries for human embryonic stem cells and pluripotent stem cell lines. And you can see in some countries, the use of embryonic stem cell lines is strictly restricted. In most countries or many countries, it's, it's fine to do it, to also derive new embryonic stem cell lines. And in many countries, there is no legislation at all. Uh, this is regularly updated. So HIPSCRATCH, the registry, has a, has a committee of national representatives. Uh, from all countries where lines have been registered. There's one person who helps, at, helps us updating this uh, legal uh, framework, but also helps us evaluating informed consent information sheets. So I want to go to the next, uh, what we implemented a few years ago is a clinical trial database. One of the reasons for restricting embryonic stem cell research was at, in 2000, until, until 2010 perhaps, the ambiguity of benefit. So there is a promise of benefit, for example, help patients with diseases which are untreatable using cell therapy based on embryonic stem cells. But this was only a promise, which was outbalanced in some countries by the need to destroy a human embryo. It's a, it's a blastocyst stage to make a embryonic stem cell line. Now we have over 130 clinical trials using derivatives of pluripotent stem cell lines, how, about half of them from embryonic stem cell lines. So there is a balance shift. There is not only a promise of, 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 of benefit, but there is a concrete uh, work into benefit. So this is, this is the number of clinical trials in different countries. This is only from February. It increases almost monthly. Now we have 131 clinical trials in the registry, and this is manually curated. So we, we pull the information from data sources. We don't ask people who do clinical trials to register them. Also, that's a possibility. So, and you can see from that table that the number of applications and the number of cell types derived from pluripotent stem cells used for clinical trials increased a lot. So in the beginning, that was like three or four diseases, mostly eye diseases, some Parkinson's and some cardiac diseases, but now we have um, quite a lot of applications and different cell types being used in clinical trials. Um, so this is again uh, the database. Um, we started that in 2010 when the first clinical trial was was uh, adapted um, yeah, in, in 90, 96 trials and the end of 22, now 131, 51 um, diseases, or 54 um, up from 39. So uh, this is how it looks like. It's not very easily to, easy uh, to filter and to search, but be working on that. Um, so we have some information on if at each clinical trial and of course a link to the, to the uh, clinical trial coordinator. And the link to the other databases which, which have clinical trials on their, on their uh, platform. 
for example, clinicaltrials.gov or the WHO clinical trial registry. Uh, but it's very hard in these to find clinical trials which have specifically done this pluripotent stem cell lines. Uh, in altogether in the registry, we have now about uh, 1,000 embryonic stem cell lines, and the number is almost stagnant, only slowly increasing, about 13,000 IPS cell lines, of which only 5,300 are submitted, so the 13,000 are registered without at enter many data. So we, they cannot be submitted. There's a restriction on submission. You need a certain number of, certain number of data already present before you can do that. Uh, 131 clinical trials. For the clinical trials, the strange thing is that we cannot find out in about 30% of the cases, uh, no, in 70% of the cases, which IPS cell line has been used. For embryonic stem cell lines, that's possible, but for IPS cell line, this is often very difficult to find out. And we have about 2,000 certificate issued, mainly for use in EU-funded research where that is a requirement. So this is, you can also search by country, so how many cells have been registered in the registry per country, and the most lines are from China and the US. Um, so what is the future? So we think that these kind of registries or registries of cells or to, are necessary to democratize, if I want to use the same word as, as uh, the first speaker, uh, the field. Uh, and this is very obvious in my eyes for the pluripotent stem cell field. We have data on the donor, data on the application, which can be comprehended to, or need to be comprehended to one cell line where the, where the work has been done with, or with it where the donor is known. And uh, of course, it cannot be, all the data cannot be in one registry, but the registry can provide, let's say, a, a, a poll position to link to these data and find them. Um, Cellosaurus is doing that also on a on much larger basis for all cell types, but we focus on pluripotent stem cell lines. And we already linked to some of these resources. The hardest is the clinical resource, because these, these data are sensitive personal data, the same actually for SDR data, which has sensitive personal data and cannot be as such fully public. A fraction of that can be fully public, but the others, at least in Europe, cannot be made public uh, because they allow re-identification in theory of the donor. So um, just for last slide, uh, we work in close collaboration with the European Bank for IPS cell lines, which have the physical lines. We manage their data. And uh, this works in a way that the lines are uh, registered first before they are banked in the registry. We link these inf the information to other resources if, if they are there, for example, uh, genetic data in EBI. Um, and then the data is, when, once the data are complete for the bank, the, the cell lines can be banked, and then uh, new data will be perhaps derived in terms of quality control, which are then fed back to the registry. So now we have batch data. So we don't register publicly all these different batch data. We have basic data in the registry. The batch data are only available through the bank. Um, so moving forward, what do we really want to do the next? Uh, so we want to kind of solve the issue of data sharing, even with sensitive personal data. So this needs certain conditions, and I know that many institutions work on that problem, yeah, to anonymize and then be able to change or have um, certain silos which are accessible for certain purposes and so on. We have established a data access committee which works somehow for genetic data, but it's very tedious. Um, so we want to uh, harmonize the mandatory information for the hip scratch information. Um, so we've 
we see that many labs use different standards to characterize their lines. Uh, many banks still use Excel sheets, many cell banks. Uh, and to get these lines into hip scratch is only possible in the moment on a manual basis or when the Excel sheet data fields are kind of harmonized with our data sheets, we can import them using APIs. Uh, and we increasingly use this uh, possibility. Um, we, there will be a standard by the ISO on stem cell data interoperability. We are working in that, and uh, which is high level. Well, it's not so concrete. And um, again, we want to have a legal pathway established, and we do that with the US and with Chinese partners to be able to ex exchange uh, data. Um, yeah, in the end, we also wanted, want, uh, so this AI, I mean, increasingly we all use AI, we can search text and we can find a lot of information on a cell line searching text. So, but with the AI, there are two issues very important. One is the question you ask, and second, the data you use. And if you use a curated database like, like HipScratch, for example, you have, you can rely somewhat on the data and want, we want to improve that uh, AI usability of this uh, database. We also want to include uh, organoids in the database or links to organoid research, and we would be happy to to talk about this with, with uh, Amos. So, and we uh, focus again on the ethical provenance issue, which is currently a lot of manual work, but it can be using AI, for example, uh, certain language models may be automatized, automated. So with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would link, like to also thank my team. We are about six people in the moment and the IBM team for hosting us. So this is our contact. Thank you. Any other questions? You said you, re you rely on the users that they register their cell lines. How can you force them to do that? Because otherwise it's, it, the database will never be complete. Yeah, it will. Yeah, it will never be complete. And uh, I mean, if we don't do it, we can only rely on published data. Uh, and many just don't publish their data. Uh, so we, we, uh, so one incentive to, for registration is the, is when, for, when funders enforce, let's say, a certification by a trusted registry. And we do that for the European Commission and also EMBL is asking for certificates. So, but this is all what we have in the moment on the side of funders to support this kind of, you know, quality control. And, and our argument is all, all, always reproducibility. If, if you want to have reproducible research, you need to make sure that your cell line is biologically of high quality, but also you also want to avoid ethical problems and later on, or legal, which then translates easily into legal problems. So we also provide this ethical provenance thing. Um, and the second incentive is publishers. If publishers and solicitors know that, and the RID is very well recognized by publishers, if publishers ask the researchers to provide maybe a certificate or at least an identifier, a unique identifier that would be already a, a big help. And community pressure, yeah. So we collaborate with uh, many uh, communities, stakeholder societies, so to say, and, and hope that this penetrates more and more to the, and, and when we look at our numbers, indeed we get uh, increasing numbers of registered lines. But we will never be hundred percent. Yes, I, I have not a question, but a comment uh, <coughs> with regard to the genotypes of the IPS cell lines, uh, because you mentioned um, it, it could be traceable uh, to to living persons and. Um, the standards, so Christopher Koch and me, we chaired uh, the standard developing uh, organization 
and we made it impossible because uh, so it's not uh, the system of CODIS used by FBI nor uh, by Interpol, so you, the European forensic system. So this is uh, independent. So we share loci, yes, that's true, but uh, it's not traceable. So we share only partially STRs. Yeah, and no other genetic information which could lead to identification. So um, the question is how much of the partial STR should we share? Uh, there's different opinion in the community. One says eight is, uh, gives you only a confidence of let's say 90%, um, which is not identifying. But this is open to discussion. I mean, it's not trivial, yeah. Mm. Other questions? Mm. 